Hello and welcome to The Mastering Show. My name is Ian Shepherd. I'm a mastering engineer and I run the Production Advice website, aiming to help you get uh, the best out of recording, mixing and mastering your music. This episode, I it's hard to convey how excited I am to be talking to my guest because we all use the word legend occasionally and I probably use it too much. You're looking for something to describe somebody and you call them legendary and it's always a little bit tongue in cheek, but in this case, it's not tongue in cheek at all because I'm talking to Steve Lillywhite, who is a genuine legend. So, Steve, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to oh, me today, and anytime. welcome to the podcast. Yeah, I, I, I think I would be a legend if I died tomorrow. I think that you know, <laughs> to, to really cement legendary status, you know, when you're when you're when you're sort of on the on the edge of the legendary status, a death will cement it for sure. You know, so um, that's one. Okay, well, in that case, you're not legendary. I don't want you to die, so, oh, so let's okay. let's not say that. But I mean, come on. I mean, for anybody who's listening to this who doesn't know your track record, uh, I'm not quite sure why you're listening to this podcast. Well, I've been very lucky, to be honest. Over the years, I've I've worked with some fantastic artists. My one of my things, and it's so simple, is that you know, how do you get a hit? You need the work. How do you get the work? You need a hit. So it's sort of a catch twenty two situation. So. When I got my very first hit, my first thought was, this is brilliant. I've had a hit. Now I can work with really good people. You know, and if your ego doesn't get in the way, I want to do as little as possible. And I want to work with the best people. And by working with the best people, you've got to have a hit. All of a sudden I had the hit. So it was sort of simple after that. It was How did you get your hit? Was that the psychedelic first? No, it was Susie and the Banshees. Hon oh, okay. Hong Kong Garden, number seven in 1978. And it was a great record, actually. And I, and I knew it would be a hit because punk rock was this sort of wave that was, that was you know, that was coming across England. And, mm. I, and I'd read about Susie and the Banshees. They, they'd done this legendary Lord's Prayer at the 100 Club. And they were written about front page of all the music press, as you remember, Sounds, Melody Maker and Enemy. And all they had to do was to make a good record. And I knew it would be a hit. And they'd recorded their first single for Polydor, but the band didn't like it. And I was producing Johnny Thunders at the time. And the manager of Susie and the Banshees came to the studio, liked the sound of what he heard and said, Steve, you know, we've recorded our first single, but we don't like it. Would you like to you know, do you want to have a go at it? So I said, okay. And I went and recorded it and it was a hit. So, you know, from then on, I just basically thought, well, this is fantastic. I love working with creative people. But even that doesn't quite answer the question because you were already, I mean, Johnny Thunders was already a name. Well, okay, let's go further back than that. I was an assistant at a studio called Phonogram. I started in 1972 and, um, and at weekends, and, and, and it was a very, you know, th this is for technical people and, you know, and they'll find this funny. This was the There's plenty of them listening to this. Yeah, this was the last studio in London that had a separate machine room. So I was in what was called Room B and there was a, basically a swan neck microphone on the mixing desk that came to an Auratone style speaker in Room B. So I would hear the music from the monitors through the swan neck microphone into my little Auratone and the engineer would talk into the mic and say, OK, play from the top or pun uh, record on track 12 or a drop in was called a cue to press. So mm -hmm. I became this sort of incredible tape op because I would listen to the music and, and I would sort of think, well, maybe they want to do the second verse again. So at the end of a take, I would go back to the second verse while they were discussing it. So then when the engineer said, yes, we'll do the second verse again, I was right there. You know, because in those days, it was the time of the tape re rewinding. Mm -hmm. So I, this is actually one of my, my theories, is that you can either do the least in your job, or if you've got a sort of, not boring job, but a job that doesn't, you know, really all I had to do was press buttons, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I had to make it as interesting as possible. And I've and, and it was great, actually. So I became a really great tape op. But the thing was that I never saw what was happening on the engineering side because I was not, there literally was not a, um, there was not, in a room. There wasn't, yeah, there was not a remote on the desk. So if I wasn't at my station, 
they couldn't hear what the song was. So I had a talk back, but I was told you mustn't talk back. And quite <laughs> rightly, because I wasn't part of the, 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 the bon homi of the control room, you know. Mm. Um, so as it was a, a, a wonderful studio and it was studio culture, there was promotions to be had and you went from tape op to engineer. And, you know, there was a sort of in-between part. But how could I how could I even get an engineering job if I'd never been in there? So my boss, who was a wonderful, wonderful man, basically allowed us at weekends or any downtime to go and do our own session. So I took in this band who were Ultravox. Actually, they were mm. called Tiger Lily at the time. But this was the first incarnation of Ultravox with a guy called John Fox. With John Fox, um, which... You know, in my head was actually a, a better version of Ultravox. It was like a, a sort of a punk rock, Roxy music. Mm, it was much more punk, wasn't it? Yeah, it was more punk. So I did their demos, actually. And then the band went off to Island Records and got a record deal. And Island Records said, look, who's going to produce? They said, we love working with Steve. They said, well, who's Steve Lily White? Quite right, because I'd never made a record before. And they said, well, we like Brian Eno as well. So... It, my first ever production credit was a three-way production between Brian Eno, Ultravox, and me. Was so Brian Eno that early on? That's amazing. Yeah, that was the first time I met Brian. And the second time I worked with Brian was on the Joshua Tree, which was, <laughs> um, which was a, a bit of a gap. A bit of a gap, yeah, a few years later. But, um, yeah, so I, Ultravox wasn't a hit, but that got me – that got me a little bit of work. And I went to all the gigs. I was at every, you know, I was out every night if I wasn't working. And, um, and I remember actually seeing a review of some band and I was actually in the review and I, they called me ubiquitous. And I, <laughs> for some reason I thought that was a, that was, it wasn't really a compliment, you know, but no. uh, <laughs> the ubiquitous Steve Lillywhite. I thought that's amazing. Then I looked it up and went, Oh, right. Well, at least I was mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't get mentioned, you're not, you know. But, but, but how did you even get the assistant job? Because, I mean, that's... Oh, uh, I was... What, what made you decide you wanted to be a producer? Oh, my God, fear. It's always been fear. Because at school, I got two O-levels, didn't go into the sixth form, did a second year fifth and got two more O-levels... And basically, the headmaster said, you don't really want to be here, do you? And I said, no. So I was sort of half expelled and half, you know, I, I, it's, it's sort of more, more romantic to say I was expelled, but I'm more dribbled out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> but you say you say fear, but most people, so, so you're, you're out in the, market, the, the world, like kind of, oh, no, what am I going to do now? I mean, you're a bass player, right? Yeah, I was a bass player. I, I was in a band, but, you know. So you thought if I could work in a studio, that's something I know about? Is that No, what you're I knew nothing about studio. Oh, this was it. I, I said to my dad, I, you know, he said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know, but I love music. And he, this is a funny story. He knew a guy. My dad was a sort of a middle class businessman. And he knew uh, another guy who knew a guy who knew the boss of Philip's pressing plant in Walthamstow. Okay. Uh, so my dad made a couple of calls. He was, you know, he was one of those post-war dads, very, you know, not that close. Uh, I never remember hugging my dad, but he did one great thing for me. He got me to go to the, uh, uh, to go and look at the pressing plant. He came up with me. So we went to this pressing plant and I'm wandering around seeing people like, you know, making records literally with a, with a mm. stamper, you know, and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. of course I said to the boss, Oh, any jobs going here? And he sort of looked at me and went, well, they could be baked beans really. And, and of course I, you know, <laughs> so I said, um, yeah, but, and he said, but we do have a recording studio in London. There's no jobs or whatever, but you know, maybe you want to go and have a look. Cause I was, you know, Mr. Enthusiastic all the time. But not really thinking. I said, oh, I, I'll go and work in a baked bean factory. It was like that because I didn't think, I thought this is music. Yeah. So, so anyway, I went to the recording studio and um, with my dad. And this was one of those, it was just a wonderful coincidence that the day I went for my, uh, it wasn't an interview or anything, but I just went to have a look. 
was that one of the two tape operators decided to quit. Just that day? Just that day. It was, you know, and of course I said, oh, you know, have you got any jobs? And he goes, well, that's funny. You know, we get... What- it's amazing how often that happens because I talked to, to Matt Colton from Alchemy Mastering recently right. and he said virtually the same thing. He was chatting uh, to a friend in the pub who said, maybe you should look in, I think it was uh, Music Week or Melanie Maker or one of the, one of the yeah. magazines, you know? So, and, and Matt kind of looked and sure enough, that day there was a job available yeah. um, at a mastering studio and off he went and that was the beginning of it all. It's bizarre how that happens. It is. It's, you know, timing can have a lot of, of, uh, of great benefits, but, you know, you, it only gets you so far. At the end of the day... You- yeah, well, then you do what you said, which is being... The, be- the most useful person in the room for whatever it is you're doing. Best T-boy. And for some reason, being in a recording studio environment was just something I loved. I always say my, my personality just suits being in a studio. I, I, it's like being in the womb for me. It's fantastic. I've, I've had all these, you know, I've had some other jobs like in corp- music corporations and none of them. I mean, I just, you know, it's just so much fun being with creative people. I mean, that's what it is. I, if I'm around accountants too much or, or, or anyone else like that, it's, you know, it's not my thing. So I got the hit and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rest is history, including this incredible track listing. And stuff. I mean, it's interesting because one of my questions was going to be what, you know, what, the first blog post I did for the website, which is still one of the most popular, even though it's kind of less and less relevant to what I usually talk about, was what what is a producer? What does a producer do? And of course, the answer is there's at least seven or eight different kinds and probably an, an infinite number of producers. And I was going to ask you what kind you were and, and then what makes you good. But I think you've answered that because it's it's like it's enthusiasm and just being really good at whatever it is you're doing at any one moment. Would you yes, agree with that? It is. But it's, you know, I think it's also knowing when I, I always think there's two sorts of producers. There's the one who does nothing and the one who does everything. You know, I'm never the guy who does everything. I'm not, you know, I'm not a shipbuilder. The bad, the artist is always the shipbuilder, but my job is to decorate it and steer it safely to port. You know, and as we know, the Titanic was a great ship, but it had a bad captain. So, um, so that's how I sort of describe what I do, you know. And also, I hate anyone who says, Steve, I'll do whatever you want. I don't, I hate that. What I love right. is someone saying to me, Steve, I've got 10 ideas, but I don't know how they, and I say, okay, give me the 10. I'm, okay, we'll take that one. I like that, right. but I don't like this one, but change that chord maybe. Or then we'll take a bit of this one and join it together with that one. So I, I love, put, you know, I've got this sort of logical mind that look, looks at music as, as a jigsaw puzzle almost. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, man, I've, never, I've never said that before. That, that, that may be true. Because even though in a lot of parts of my life I'm the most untogether person there is, but when it comes to being in a studio and, and identifying the hook and making sure that that, that is well represented, you know, um, that's, I, I feel like I'm good at that, yeah. I think you. I think you can probably say that. I think the, the evidence supports you there. Do you, I'm interested. Do you also do you do the same thing with songs? Because I've heard you say before that when you're working on an album, uh, the songs are like your babies. It's not yeah, possible it, to it, choose it a favourite one. Yeah. Um, but I mean, a key part of being a producer is to help the band. I'm guessing, kind of, you know, work on decent songs, work on songs that are worthwhile. So do you do you reject songs as well and say, oh, we should go with this one and that one, or do you? Is that kind of later in the stage? By then. But at the time you've agreed to work with somebody, you know that the songs are good and then it's just refining what they've got. Obviously, one of my biggest production decisions ever is agreeing to do it. That's how I always think. Because once I've agreed to do it, I've then got to unlock whatever is necessary to make a great record. And, you know, I've been around for so long that I really cannot say that there are any set rules. I mean, the only rule I ever have is no food in the control room. Other than, other than that, I mean, if you say it has to be in time, I can show you records that are not in time. If you say it has to be in tune, sometimes when things are in tune, they just sound flat, which is why actually I don't like doing sort of print interviews of technical stuff because, you know, I'm, I'm amazed when I, I hear people with such, with such guarantees that I use a D12 on the bass drum or I do this, I do that. I don't think like that. I mean, I suppose you have to have some rules, but I, I really did come from punk rock. 
And that was that was an attitude. It was all about attitude. It wasn't about the rules. It was breaking the rules and it was and it was pushing the boundaries. And, you know, a lot of my early records were really pretty out there. You know, um, Mm -hmm. as you get older, you 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 change, of course, and technology helps you change because technology is always the driver of the art form. I always believe that, you know, ever since electric guitars made drummers play louder. So drummers play <laughs> different. You know, that's technology. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, that's technology driving the art form. Well, I mean, so, so stuff like uh, Peter Gabriel using the Fairlight for the first time and things. I, I was there. We broke a bottle and played it on a keyboard. I thought mm. it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. And then, of course, they come free now in cornflakes boxes. So... <laughs> I'm interested in in the, the technical thing because a few times you've said to me that you're not a technical person. In fact, you were just telling me before we started the call that you were you, you're setting up a studio where you are and you've got somebody helping you with the technical stuff. And I want to get onto that later. Yeah, but of course. Um, I I think you're being too humble again because you know you say oh I've been lucky, but if you take a list of artists that you've worked with, so many of them have had have done their best albums or their best right. work with you. I'm not convinced that's completely by luck but also in terms of the technical stuff i don't think you can be anti-technical because you are interested in sound and in sonics you know from what i hear rick rubin his his production style is to to come into the studio at some point lie down on a sofa at the back of the uh, room listen for a while and then say okay you need to do this and leave right um i don't know how accurate that is but i feel like you're much more involved than that because I oh you know, I'm I mean, horribly you... hands on I could never do two <laughs> albums at the same time and by the way I'm not I'm not humble I'm arrogantly humble that is actually my favorite expression I'm sort of arrogantly humble I'm humble but hey you better know who I am <laughs> <laughs> yeah, See, that's good that's interesting because I'm a mixture of or, or I think mastering engineers have to be a mixture of humble and arrogant as well, yeah, because yeah, yeah. at the end of the day, it's an arrogant thing to come in and say, OK, I'm going to make your music sound like this that you've been yeah. working on for two or three, four years. But you also have to be humble in the sense you have to you have to take so, that step, kind of them. listening to what's there and appreciating yeah. what was good about it to, to begin with. So going back quickly about you said, oh, you know, do you change the songs at the end of the day? I always think who is going to play this record to their grandchildren? Probably not me probably the artist. So when it comes down to, to really some, you know, and you know, you have these times in the studio where you, you butt heads and you say, it should be like this. And they say, no, it should be like this. For me, it's, I will say my thing. I will use my examples. I'll make my case. But at the end of the day, I'm, I probably won't be playing this album to my grandchildren. They will be. So, you know, of course the artist Without the artists, we're nothing. And I always believe that. And that's that's how I how I sort of run, really. I, I can relate to that as well, because yeah. um, there are mastering engineers who one of the first things they do is kick stuff back to the engineer or the producer or the artist and say, no, 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 you need to fix this, 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 and this. And that's not me. You know, I there are times when if I think there's a real problem, I'll kind of make suggestions. But more often than not, it's, okay, this is what they have, you know, this is their vision. How can I help it? get closer to what they want it to be rather than kind of just going in and creating havoc. I'm also interested about, because I have a theory about what makes you good and you can see whether you agree with me Um, because you say you came out of punk and obviously that's true. And, but then you went on to work with Peter Gabriel who was, you know, had just left or recently left Genesis, which is kind of everything that antithesis. punk was rebelling against yeah and you're you know you've, you've said that you're interested in kind of sonic landscapes and yeah. um you know you are, th- there are loads of creative sounds on your records as i hadn't noticed before the the violin on sunday bloody sunday there's a big violin solo at the beginning of the song i, I hate it at the beginning um, it's really? the first song on the album and what do you hear as the first production thing is someone who's not in the band <laughs> No, it, it's disgusting. It should never have been in there at the beginning. It should have been used from the middle section onwards as an addition. No, that, that, that's still one of my... <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry to bring that up. And... No, 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 no. I've got many. That, that's the trouble when you listen back to your records, you know. But there's, yeah, I mean, there's there's loads of other stuff as well, isn't there? Like the, the way that the drums uh, suddenly go up in, in pitch as well as speed, do they, at the end of No Self-Control? No, no, no. That's on Games Without Frontiers. Yeah, no, well, actually, that's re- that was my idea. You see, I am being 
I'm not, you know, I, we slowed the tape down half speed for the last bit, but then we overdubbed things at 30 IPS at normal speed. So everything doubled in speed, but some things didn't. And that's at the end of, if you listen to the end of Games Without Frontiers, you'll hear that half the, the, half the track goes at double time and that's going from 15 IPS to running the tape at 30 IPS. I can't remember. It's something like that. But I remember doing that. Yeah. You know, the thing with Peter is that when I got the phone call, I thought it was someone mucking around. Because as you say, Peter came from before 77. And anything before 77 to us skinny white boys was, you know, was, was you know, and the fact that he wore a horse's head, that was as, as bad as it became, you know. But of course... I, I, I would never let guitarists bend notes in those days. And, that, and you know, that's, that's, that's dismissing everything that Dave Gilmore has ever done. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'm a lot more uh, open now. When Peter called me, I, um, I you know, but, but he said, Steve, I want you to be who you are. You know, that's, you know, I, I don't like all that. You know, I, you know, he wanted the attitude of punk. And that, for me, was always the most important thing about punk rock, because musically it was a limited art form. You know, I was lucky to work with your XTCs, Psychedelic Furs and, you know, and, and stuff. But, but, you know, and I never worked with the UK subs and, and, and those sort of bands who were just, you know, but they all had the same attitude. It's just I went, always went more for the music. And Peter said, look, I want that attitude. So we were always doing the thing that wasn't the the usual thing that was our you know it was yeah and a, I, th I think you, you achieved that because yeah. the I mean with that album is a perfect example because it's nothing like what he was doing with Genesis or even you know his first album I think yeah, and, and actually you you yeah. there you're I think you've confirmed my theory because my theory is that you know you came from punk but actually you've got I think quite a lot of appreciation for all that more kind of proggy Oh. attitude and the, the clever stuff and i think you strike the perfect balance between them my theory is that if you had a punk band you would persuade them to put in some interesting proggy stuff and if you had a prog band you would get it more stripped back and lean and authentic and yeah, simple yeah. no you're right and i think maybe xtc in retrospect were that band okay you know xtc were fantastic that they i mean maybe a little bit more arty than than, than punky but you know they 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 had the no, they had their songs. Some some of their songs, like there's uh, oh, there's some great songs on Drums and Wires and Black Sea. Two great albums. But you know, if you like XTC, you like everything they've done. It's, they're, they're one of those bands, really. So I'm going to take a, a little tangent. Um, yeah. And ask you something that's always interested me, which is what happened to U2's sound, because the three albums that you did. To me, they're very lean, they're very crisp, they're quite open sounding. And then things get much more uh, thick and dark and kind of maybe a bit muddy sometimes. Some of their albums I don't actually think sound in a technical sense. I mean, they have amazing atmospheres and all the rest of it, but and this is sound that good. So my theory is that's Daniel Lanois' fault. Was that right? It was a combination. I think Brian Eno... No, it was more Brian. Brian is more the, um, and the band not wanting to stay the same. Okay. You know, I've learned so much from you two that the, the idea that, or maybe we learned together or maybe I helped them learn. I don't know. I don't, you know, but the idea, I remember the Beatles first time round and what I loved about them, every time I heard a new Beatles song on the radio, it sounded like the Beatles, but it was different. Whereas the Dave Clark Five and all these other bands, every one of their singles always sounded like their last single. Because the Beatles didn't sound like it, but you knew it was the Beatles. You know, we were always trying to think like that with, with you 2 and the band were always wanting that because, you know, there, there is a difference between the first, second and third album of U2. But, mm -hmm. you know, they really changed on the fourth album. And a lot of that is that, is that you know, Brian puts a lot of keyboards on, Edge was more and more looking at the lushness of sound, I think. And funnily mm -hmm. enough, I went to Simple Minds and made them sound a bit like U2 for an album. Mm -hmm. And U2 ended up sounding a little bit like Simple Minds for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
I mean, it's really, it's deeply unfashionable to like you 2 now. Um, but I've come out in the past and said that I'm a huge fan. Uh, I'm waiting for another great album from them, and I hope they can deliver that. But, um, I mean, same thing applies to, to Coldplay. Um, people are very anti especially indie musicians you know i'm uh, i work with a lot of independent artists these days rather than the majors and you know there's this kind of blanket but for me i was wondering what you think of this i think the the ability to create something that is accessible and speaks to such a huge audience i mean on the one hand you could say it's a corporate sellout thing on the other hand you could say i mean that's what it's all about you know the biggest artists in the world you're adele and Beyonce and all the rest of it, and U2 and Coldplay and, and these kind of acts, that to me doesn't seem like a reason to kind of poo-poo what they're doing, to dismiss what they're doing. Um, that's something to be celebrated. Do you agree with that? Oh, of course, of course. I mean, look, it becomes more and more difficult to dodge the bullets, as we say, as you get older. You know, and um, I think U2, you know, I don't know. that There is a theory, maybe, and it's it's is that Coldplay have done what U2 should have done. For me, Coldplay have managed to, to enter the modern world a little bit more than U2. You know, Head Full of Stars, songs like, you know, they're really good. I'm loving Coldplay in a way. No, Coldplay are the real, I hate people who say the real deal, as if anyone is not, you know. But they, mm. they have managed to change to the modern sound and to remain relevant maybe a little bit better than you two at the moment. See, that's interesting because I, I, I know exactly what you mean and I kind of agree with it. On the other hand, it almost makes it less interesting to me. I'm almost more interested in you two not quite getting it right <laughs> than, than Coldplay nailing it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yes, I understand that. I understand that. It's a little bit, yeah. Well, I, you know, I know the U2 method of making records and it's so, so chaotic, which is why they do at times, reach such incredible heights. The argument that great art can only come from chaos is maybe the mantra that Bono is always thinking about in the back of his head, even if he doesn't say it. Mm -hmm. Everything about U2 is so well organized, except the art. The art side of it is, <laughs> is just so wonderfully, you know, everyone knows the stories about Bono singing with the 58 in the control room, full volume, you know. And, but that is really true. And he's even sung on the mastering at some point, apparently. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, like, you know I, I don't know Coldplay. I've never worked with them. I've worked with U2 on nine albums or so. You know, obviously, I'm a lot more close and they're my mates. And I've known them for well over half our lives. You know, I was, as I was talking to someone today, I said, God, Bono was 22 or 21 when he sung the first album. You know, that yeah. is so... Um, well, that in itself is an incredible achievement, isn't it? Because, I mean, OK, they may not have nailed it with the last couple of albums. Right, but yeah. The, I, I think they still have the potential to nail it. Yeah. Um, you know, let's hope they do. And and to, to achieve that over such a, a, a long time scale, you know, I mean, you know, I know that the, the Stones did some decent gigs recently, but I don't think... Yeah, but they've not made know, a the, good record since 83. I mean, I made an album with them in 87 and that was pretty awful. It's only got... <laughs> their albums have only got worse since, you know, but... Um, no, it's, no, no, tell us what you really think, Steve. <laughs> no, it's, look, I know, it's, you know, I always say I made the worst Rolling Stones album <laughs> until the next one. <laughs> no, the last good song I think they did was Undercover of the Night. I thought that was great. But, you know, the hit single off my Rolling Stones album was a cover version of Harlem Shuffle. You know, it was OK, right. but it was, uh, you know, it was not groundbreaking. It, no, it was a cover version. Yeah. OK, so here's, here's a little thing that we have in common. OK. And, and initially I felt bad about it and then I felt OK again. And I'm just curious to see. I've mastered a lot of uh, Peel sessions oh, over the years. Right. Um, and one of my favourites and one that I got a really nice review of was the Lars. Oh. Um, and the, the specific quote in the review that I felt really smug about at the time was it basically said... It's better than the album. Yeah, it said, this is how the Lars should have sounded. Yeah. Um, which was kind of crazy because it was just them on stage, you know, or in a, in a, in a BBC studio somewhere. I was very pleased with that. And then at some stage I realised that you were the guy who, at least you were the final producer to work right. on it, if not the, the whole thing. And I kind of, I felt bad. I was like, oh no. But 
then I heard you talking about it and it seems like that whole album was just this fascinating conundrum because he was never happy with it, was he? No, he was never happy. And um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole podcast that we could talk about. I mean, honestly, I could go on. For okay, how- deal. <laughs> we could do a weekly one about everyone I've worked with if you want. But it's... Okay, um- yep, deal. Done. <laughs> but no, he, he was, you know, I, I, what, let me give you one example. Say... For instance, you know the term, the goalposts are wider for the home team. Have you heard that expression? I have, yes. You know, that's the, of course they're not wider, but it's an expression. Now, mm. for Lee Mavers, to be honest, he actually believes they are physically wider. And, and that's, a, that's a strange thing to say, but that's his... But he's such a talent. He was probably, pound for pound one of the greatest people I've ever worked with. And that's no question about it. Mm. You know, if you could put everyone I've ever worked with, give them an acoustic guitar and line them all up and say, do two minutes of a song, Bono, Dave Matthews, Chris Cornell, uh, Lee Mavers, you know, all these people, Lee Mavers would win, you know, because Mm. the really powerful singer, really powerful presence. And I always take the blame so, you know, that's a producer's job. I cannot ever blame the artist, and I just didn't unlock him correctly, you know. But do you think anybody could have? I mean, that's oh, the thing, isn't it? After the album came out, Johnny Marr phoned me up and said, Steve, I love the Lars. I'm going in the studio with Lee, and, um, you know, I can't wait. Can you give me any tips? And I said, well, you know, I, I can't remember what I told him. But anyway, like two weeks later, Johnny called me up and said, Steve, I can't believe it. All he wants to do is to record the first album again. I'm trying to get him to do new songs, and he won't. All he wants to do is to do that album. Right. Because he disowned because, it, didn't he? Yeah. Because the album wasn't right, he didn't think it was, you know, it means nothing to him. And it's well, not right to him. I mean, it was still huge, wasn't it? And I mean, it sounds great it, to me. It's, but, but he, in his head, it was never done. So therefore, it never existed. It was like, it's like that goalpost thing is the only way I can sort, you know. And it's sad because he was so talented and he, he would play a couple of songs and I go, that's a great song. Can we, re-? he said, no, that's for the second album, you know, and <laughs> literally. And then they never came out because he's yeah. never got over the first album. And that's sad, you know, and it is. Yeah. You know, I listened to it the other day, actually. And, and there's some great songs on there, you know, not just there she goes, which everyone loves, but um, mm. Liberty, I know there's some great songs, but no, I think one of the things because it had gone on too long and the peel session that you mastered was because it was just something that happened without thinking. And of course in the studio, there's thinking involved. And I Mm. think that is what, what sort of sunk us all. Yeah. It's well, I mean, and the other thing is who knows, he might listen to that peel session and be like, no, absolutely not. Right. You know, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? He had this vision in his head and yeah. you and the other, what, five other people, was it, worked on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Not at the same time. I was... Yeah, did, didn't, didn't manage to figure it out. But so it, it is a shame. But anyway, yeah, it's like I say, I, I feel less bad about the comment on the my version of it now that I know that it was such a struggle to get the original. <laughs> well, it was a struggle, but it's I will never, ever say anything bad about Lee Mathers. Well, maybe I have in the past, but but I honestly, he is one of the most talented people. And... And, and it was five producers who failed to get it right because the talent was there, the songs were there. We failed, you know. So it's just so happened that I was the guy at the end that, that, that managed to get it out. But it's, you know, we, we failed. That's the, that's the question. We failed our artist. And, yeah, that's... Uh, but that's sad because, you know, imagine if he'd been happy, he would have... You know, maybe Oasis, N- Noel Gallagher wouldn't have bothered. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you turned that into a positive there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so going up, going back to the, the gear thing and the and the techie thing, um, because I think you're probably more insecure about the technical stuff than you need to be, or, or again, more humble. Because am, am I right that you effectively had a home studio really early on before it was? Yeah, I had a home studio when I was married to Kirsty. And um, I would do, 
I mean, I think I mixed a, uh, a, the one Smiths thing I ever did. I mixed a song called Ask in my studio on, on my own. I didn't have a, a, an engineer or anything. Uh, and that was just a room in a house, was it, with a, a load of yeah, gear in it? it? Just, I got my old friend, Brian Haywood, who was a studio designer. He, we, he built a room within a room. And, um, and, and it was great. I had an Amec Angela in there and a 24 track. And, uh, and I did a lot of Kirsty's records there, actually. What we would do, we would spend money going into townhouse, you know, expensive studio, and spend money on musicians, have five or six people playing at the same time, and then I and just do a lot of takes, no overdubs, and then I would go home and I would edit the multi tracks and make the decent. Uh, because when you have six people playing in a studio at the same time, if it doesn't sound like a record, you're not doing it right. You know, I think that's that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Five or six people should make it, it should sound like a record if five or six people play. If it doesn't sound like a record, then there's something wrong in the arrangement, something wrong in what people are playing. So we would do a lot of time, spend a lot of time playing the song in the studio and just recording everything. And then I would take it home. I would edit between the takes. And then I, because with Kirsty, you needed about 10 tracks for vocals on every song, you know, because every song was a Beach Boys you know, hundreds of harmonies. And, yeah. you know, I could never tell her don't do it because she was so bloody good at it. Um, yeah. So then we do all the vocals and then go back to the fancy studio to mix it. Um, it you know, mix the, mix the singles maybe, not necessarily all the songs. But, um, yeah, I had a home studio then. And actually today is the day, my first day ever since 1995, actually, when, I, when Kirsty and I split up, that I'd been in the studio of my own so it's quite ah, uh, yeah a landmark occasion a landmark occasion although there's not any tape to be seen obviously no that's sad it's interesting you um you were talking earlier about tape and the rewinding thing that is the the biggest factor that i hear talking to to pro engineers because there's a lot of nostalgia for working on tape um and i think lots of people who've never done it don't realize what a pain in the ass oh, it was. it was a complete pain um, in the ass and it, and the whole rewinding thing that you're talking about you know that or, or, the, or the running, you know, getting to the end and not having quite enough time to do another take at the end of a reel. Um, yeah. is, where, where are you at with that? Do you, oh. Because do you, was there actually, a, other, I've heard other people say there is a benefit to the rewind time because it gives people time to process and to, to kind of cool down and well, internalise what just happened. And Yes, but it's always the producer's job to lead on that. If you feel that you need that time, you can't blame the technology that it's too quick. No, that is a ridiculous argument, Ian. You know, okay. if you think that someone is going to benefit from their performance, and actually the only artist I've known who actually has ever done that is Chris Cornell. I did a solo album with him, and at the end of a take, I would go, okay, how, you know, blah, 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 nothing. He wouldn't say anything. Hmm. And so I just... And, but, but then I re he wasn't angry or anything like that. He was just... Get, just getting himself again. He said, okay, hold it. Oh, he would say something like that. I would. Five minutes just sitting there. He said, okay, go again. So, yes, it's very important if you know, you know, with, with things like overdubs, you know, you, you, you don't go immediately. You, you do let people get ready to start again. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's different for every artist, isn't it? Because there's well, people course, where yeah. it's it's the first take, and there's people where it's the tenth or the twelfth take, right. and then there's people where it's scattered throughout all the takes. I mean, well, it's... I, what I actually think that you know, for me, I would never live in any other time other than now, and I mean that with everything in my life, and that includes studios. I love mm -hmm. the take. You know, the thing about tape is that so many, you know, probably fifty percent of your time in the studio, you would hear something coming in of a band because bands would play at the same time and then you say to the band come and have a listen they come and have a listen and, and it didn't sound as good and you couldn't put your finger on it in terms of anything that it just didn't have it you know so so tape was all people say oh i love the sound of tape but tape was actually never it was always a compromise you know i remember thinking i'm going to put a dog whistle on a song um, because wouldn't it be fun that on the fourth track, everyone's dog would always start barking and no one knew why. So yeah. I did ended up putting the dog whistle on and actually we couldn't actually get it. No, th this is more of a mastering thing. We couldn't, this was before CDs. 
a, a John Dent. Do you remember John Dent? Oh yeah, absolutely. John Dent could not um, could not master it. The, the, the mastering wouldn't go up to what the dog whistle frequency was. <laughs> yep, so, exactly. So you couldn't put a dog whistle on a song. Now, actually, you know, you probably could, and and you could have people people's dog always going crazy on track four. But um, <laughs> I think the Beatles wanted to do that in the outro, in the, the run out groove of uh, Sergeant Peppers. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a little loop in there that included it's, But it's not a dog whistle because you're right, because you can't go high enough in frequency so we can hear it as well. And it's right. not as annoying to dogs as you would want to be. Anyway. OK, so you've mentioned mastering and this is the mastering show. So I should probably. What's your experience with, with mastering? mastering? Do, you, do you get involved or not? I mean, do you. Has it, has it been good? Is it, did you send stuff off and then hate the way it comes back? Or well, are you always there making absolutely sure it's right? How does it work with you? There's that one guy in LA. I won't mention his name. But, you know, I, 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 and it was on the... Well, no, I can't say that because then you'd know who it was. It was on an album I produced. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I remember sending it and it just sounded so crunchy and so, you know, loud and so... Everything that, you know, your wonderful podcasts and your, and your way of teaching the world, that, that it's all just apparent, you know, it's nothing yeah. to do with, it's volume, but, but it means nothing because what is volume? You know, that whole thing that, that you so eloquently try and educate us all. And of course, you know, it was just, it was, it, so from then on, I, you know, I, my, my favorite catchphrase was to a mastering engineer, don't make it worse. You know, mm -hmm. um, but as you know, mastering is, is, it's like, well, it's still called, it's called mastering, but it, is it the same? It's nothing like what the guy used to do. You know, it's a completely different set of parameters and stuff. There's one mastering engineer who, who recommends that the artist sends them stems so he can do the mixing. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, have you heard about that? Like, you know, send the drums on one track, the vocals on it let me mix it for you because i know how it should sound which yeah. is an interesting concept you know <laughs> by interesting you mean terrible right <laughs> well i don't know i don't no, I, mean, I mean i'll be honest i have occasionally used that approach but it's yeah. always for me a last resort people that say what do you want do you want a stereo mix or stems and i say a stereo mix please i want your version of it right and then occasionally you'll get a project where there's something and either you ask them for a revision and they can't back get back into the studio or they clearly don't quite get what you're talking about. And, you know, there's a, there's a deadline you've got to hit. And it's just, you know, look, to, to, to be quick about this, just send me the stems and then I can, I can do it here. So, but I see it very much as a kind of last resort, uh, you know, uh, what's the word, disaster management technique. Yes. Um, whereas I know that there are other people who, yeah, that's the way they want to work. That's what they ask for. And that, to me, yeah, I find that bizarre because I, I really like the distinction between mixing and mastering. You know, I've done a bit of both. Right. And the but, but it's it's as much job um, security as anything, isn't it? Oh, what you mean asking for stems? You Ask think they're kind stems. of it's like you're somehow trying to convince either rightly or wrongly the artist that what you can do is better than that plug-in that they can do at home for nothing. You know? Oh, there's a there's a can of worms there because <laughs> yes, exactly. But you know, we all know that plug-in. That, that, that we do at the end of our mix before we send it to the artist or send it to the, the, the on guard, I will never say rough mix, but the mix that needs them to hear. You know, we always put a little something on it to bring, to bring it up. So, you know, this is just a mastering engineer going, well, you know, hey, I always need a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, for me, it's just a question of too many variables. It's right. like people ask me whether they can master as they mix, and I kind of feel like, no, when you're mixing, you're worrying about all the elements within the song. When you're mastering it, you take a step back and you're looking yeah. at the songs in comparison to each other to try and deal with all that stuff at the same time. So even if I'm doing stem mastering, I don't actually do stem mastering. I, do, I use the stems to, do, to tweak the mix... Yeah. And then I master it, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and if I have to go around in circles a few times, well, that's that's the way that it is. But, yeah, I, I kind of feel quite strongly that they're, they're separate processes. I'm not saying anybody's wrong. Well, I think maybe it is wrrong to advocate that an artist should do that because I, I it feels disempowering. You know, it feels to me like you're sowing fear in the mind of the, yeah. the producer or the engineer. Um, and really what you should be doing is giving, you know, they should have confidence in this. Yes, because they've but spent look, this is just years on it. But Ian, this is just another version of the remixer. Because back in the day, the producer would be in charge of the whole thing from recording to mixing. 
right? And then all of a sudden, there was a friend of mine, Jerry Harrison, keyboard player of the Talking Heads, who was producing. I think he was the first person ever who decided to book the mixing engineer before the recording. This was unheard of. If anyone was going to remix the album, it was because you f***ed up. That was always the case. But he decided to minimize his risk by saying, I'm booking Tom Lord Algae to mix this album. And he had a, a, a wonderful streak of a couple of years of some very successful records based on the fact that he didn't do any, he didn't think about the mix. He just thought about the recording and then sent it to Tom, who went through his sausage machine and they all sounded the same. You know, <laughs> it was, but it was one of those things that worked. You know, and, yeah. and I, I, you know, I was the purist. I said, no, my job is if, if, if you have to give it to Tom Lord Algae or, or any of these, these guys, you know, you failed because, you, you know what I mean? I, I do. And it's very interesting because on, on the one hand, again, you, you can't take away somebody's right to decide to work that way. Yes, exactly. And I guess, I guess his argument for doing that is exactly the same as my argument for not doing a STEM <laughs> mix or master. But on the other hand... The risk is that it does lead to the kind of the sausage factory situation where you get the smaller and smaller group of, of dedicated mixers doing what they do yeah. and making everything sound the same. Um, well, I, I often say to my mixers, look, to my engineers, you can go off and be a mixer. Now, a mixer makes a hell of a lot of money. Well, back in the day, they certainly did, you know, because mm. they, could, they, could, they could run them off one a day and they get, you know, maybe one one point on the record and a, and a big chunk of money. And I would get, you know, I'd, I'd slave on the album for, for three months or four months and only get three points. You know, it was a, so they could really, really do a lot of work. But I always say to my guys, look, but none of those guys are legends. You know, <laughs> if you really want Not like I will be when I'm dead. Yeah, exactly. Well, I will be when I'm dead. Yeah, yeah, there's no question about that. It's the living legend that is the uh, is the one we uh, all. Yeah, legend is so much better than veteran. Oh my! God. Oh, it is, isn't it? Oh, it is. You know, I'm running yeah, eighty percent twenty on legend versus veteran in the press. That's good. Yeah, that's you're, pretty well. No, winning. seventy thirty. Seventy thirty. <laughs> but not that I'm looking. Not that I'm googling myself, <laughs> Ian Shepherd. How would I possibly do that? All right, let's carry on talking about mastering for a minute. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm delighted that you came in as a supporter of my idea of dynamic range day. You know, we talked about oh. the loudness thing and how I'm trying to educate people on that. Yeah. Um, and you had a fantastic quote, which I meant to double check exactly what you said, but it was basically, you know, I used to hate dynamics, but that was when I had the choice. <laughs> and these days everyone is taking that choice away from me. Um, are you still feeling like that? Where are you, where are you at on the whole issue now? I am. I, th- I, th- I think, am, am I right in saying that you are actually winning the battle? I mean, I, I, I think the war is still probably, you know, going on. But, but you've had some victories, I think. I mean, I, and I would actually, you know, without blowing your trumpet, without you, I, I don't think people would have, it would have come to people's attention and it would have just carried on becoming more ridiculous. But at least I think you've stemmed the tide and actually, you know, you, 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 you've pushed it back a little bit. Am I right in saying that? I hope so. I mean, I don't think I can take all the credit. There's a ton of other people. Uh, you know, there's a whole uh, wing of the the AES who are working on the, on the, the loudness normalization stuff, all the broadcast stuff, right. who, who are doing all the research. You know, I'm just kind of shooting my mouth off about it. And, you know, there's, there's, there's Bob Katz and uh, Bob Ludwig and there's a whole bunch of people. But I do, I'm certainly agree that we're seeing some success stories. I actually think the, the war is, has been lost by loudness because of the, all of the, the loudness management that we're seeing you know itunes and youtube and all the rest of it but but there are individual battles where people are still kind of you know the the, the bodies are still moving even though they've had their heads cut off if you like right. it's like they're still going through the motions not realizing that they, it's just pointless these days yeah um but yeah no i mean it's i'm hopeful i'm optimistic it kind of it seems to be more polarized there's there's quite a lot of things coming out you know i mean the, the new james blake album that i gave the award to on dynamic range day just sounds amazing and i'm you know i'm really hoping that people hear those things and r- realize that it, it doesn't have any influence on the 
you know the commercial aspect of it or the, really? the way that people respond to it um and kind of we get more stuff in that direction so you know fingers crossed i would say yeah. well i have to say um, but my streaming um my streaming company that i use is tidal and i'm always pretty amazed by the sound of tidal and i know that's just a you know maybe a side a side note but but um and I well, Tidal is the first one that's done that's streaming CD quality. Right. And I think that can have a big influence as well. Yeah, I, I, and I only got Tidal after the ridiculously bad press conference because, I, <laughs> you know, I'm always, I, I'm always, I'm pretty obsessed with great failures of life, you know. And so the fact that it was so universally condemned, I thought, well, I need to try this. So I put my credit card in for the free month, completely ready to cancel my credit card after the month. And I started listening to it, and I went, "Oh my God, I love this sound." So um, you know, so I'm I'm still the only white person subscribing to Tidal. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could change, and they're going to be introducing, I believe, loudness management uh, soon. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. So, how about now? You know, you, you're in a studio in your house. You've got, I think, you've got a controller for a Pro Tool system. Is that right? That's right. And you've got multiple monitors, like. Uh, Oh, what's the name of the film you mentioned? The Milk Monitor. No, I like Minority Report. <laughs> <laughs> like Minority Report, thank you. No, I have, no, look, this is... You know what? I think our hour is just about coming up, Ian. I promise you I will give you the rundown on the most recent Steve Lillywhite on the next podcast because no one's going to bother listening more than an hour or, you know, closing in on an hour. So can we do that? Because there's lots of other things I can talk about as well. I would love that. Okay, let's do that on the next one. Okay, so so we'll we'll wrap it up by saying that you are working on something very exciting. Yes, in a studio in your house in Jakarta. In J- yes, I'm living in Southeast Asia at the moment, uh, and I'm also working for Kentucky Fried Chicken. You see, there's a whole thing I can. That is my job at the moment, but I will tell you my job at Kentucky Fried Chicken next time. This is going to be interesting, Ian. I can't wait. <laughs> One thing I know that you can talk about at the moment is the fact that you're, there's a documentary being made about you. And in fact, I think I'm right in saying that the teaser video for that is on YouTube now. Is that right? It is on YouTube. It's, it's some, this, uh, this friend of mine basically phoned up and said, Steve, we need to document. You're such, you know, you make great records, but your personality needs to be exposed. <laughs> and I went, well, I'm boring. And she said, no, 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 no. Let, I, I want, so... She said, give me a day, I'll, we'll make a teaser video. And um, we did that. And, and, she, and she said, can you just get someone you know famous to say a couple of things to help get the funding? So I phoned up Bono and I said, look, can you just say a few words for this teaser so we can get the funding for this documentary? And he just, you know, he knocked it out of the park, of course. And, uh, and the, um, yeah, it's a five-minute teaser, but it, it makes me think that it could be a pretty good documentary if I get my poop together. I it absolutely could, and anybody listening to this interview will will agree with that. So I'll make sure I put the link to that in the show notes for everybody at themasteringshow.com so that you can take a look at that yourself. Steve, thank you so much. Um, I've enjoyed it so much, and I can't wait to get you back and hear about all the stuff that's going on right now. In Indonesia. I'll speak to you soon, Ian. Thanks, Steve. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed listening to that as much as I enjoyed recording it with Steve. If you did, I'm sure you'll also enjoy the episode before where I interviewed Sylvia Massey about her new book. Head over to themasteringshow.com to hear that. And there are a ton of other shows there with all kinds of stuff about recording, mixing and mastering music. You can also check out my website, productionadvice.co.uk and come and say hello on Facebook or Twitter. And Steve is out there too on Facebook, and I can guarantee that his is one of the most entertaining feeds you will subscribe to if you choose to do that. This week's episode was edited and mixed by John Tidy from reaperblog.net, and the music was by Kaylee Law. Thanks for listening.